tend to forget that a writer's presence runs counter to their best interests, and it always does. This is one thing to remember. Writers are always selling somebody out. <laughs> so uh, this brings me to this dangerous book called The Hysterectomy Walls, which I wrote 33 years ago. It took this many years for this book to get published. And not only that, but I have to show you the cover. This cover, some of my friends from my painting class are here tonight. I, I did this, at, I, I, I've been at the cancer center for the last couple of years. I had breast cancer, I was in a, a support group, and after my treatment ended, I moved into some of the other classes that they have there. And one of them was watercolor painting. And so I decided to just paint this picture. And then I decided, let's have it on the book cover. And I, I see a whole new career forming, <laughs> forming now. Um, I think the hysterectomy waltz 33 years ago was too early for its time, too rough, too fierce. It flew in the face of many traditional attitudes. It made many of its points using satire, wit, and humor. I am worried that satire might be taken now for meanness, wit for cruelty, humor for a kind of fierce anger. And I'm, wor I'm actually worried about it. Uh, I'm worried about it because I, as I was looking through it to find a section or two to read to, I thought, oh no, this is too mean, or this is too angry, or this is too tough on religion, or this is this is rough on medicine. And then I thought, well, that's how I felt when I wrote it. I often have those thoughts still now. And I have to take what comes with the work that I publish. So I'm just, I'm about to well, read a few bits of this to you. And uh, if anybody gets too upset, they can just walk out <laughs> if they don't need to. But, um, I, I'm going to read a section from a couple of chapters. Um, but I need my reading glasses. Be careful. You'll mourn for your uterus, the gray-haired counselor at the hospital told me. You'll cry over it, like any part of yourself that you lose. But think of it this way. It's only a baby carriage, and if you don't need a baby carriage anymore, why drag it around with you for the rest of your life? She glanced around to check on whether anyone was listening. A doctor was passing in the hall and she waved to him. Then she leaned forward and whispered to me, that's the official spiel required by law. Mourn, schmorn, you should give a party with champagne once it's out for good. God, what a relief. No more ruined bloody sheets, no more cramps. The only stomach ache I've ever had since my surgery was for Montezuma's revenge contracted in Acapulco and it was well worth it. When, when it's out, you can screw without goo, without pills that will give you heart attacks or strokes. Take my word for it, darling. Have a catered party. The doctor walked by the other way, and she waved again. Consulting her printed list, she continued in a formal voice. As for your ovaries, if they both have to be removed, there is no need to be concerned. Once their function is served, who needs them? And the happiest thing is, once they're gone, at least those are organs in which you can never get cancer. What about that doctor, I said, motioning to the hall. Are his childbearing days over? Oh, for sure, his kids are all grown up. They're in med school. Well, has he had his testicles removed so he doesn't have to drag them around with him anymore? Um, the counselor pondered this. It's not the same for him, dear. You know, he likes to fool around with the cute little nurses. Do you think that's fair, that I should have to get the whole kit and caboodle taken out and he gets to keep his? It's the policy of the gynos on the staff here. Once they've got you opened up, they want to get it all. They can't install a zipper, you know, and you wouldn't want to have to go back in a year and be opened up for fibroids or endometriosis or some other nonsense. Once in there, they might as well get everything. She lowered her voice again. Off the record, dear, you just fight like hell to keep your good ovary. If you scream loud enough, they may let you have your way. But if they both come out, the next morning you'll have cold sweats, Hot flashes, a mustache. <laughs> Mustaches are just part of the mythology, I said. I've read a lot in the subject. Don't try to scare me with that. But sweetheart, it's true. If you go through female castration, terrible things happen. 
dowager's hump appears, the breasts flatten, the vagina dries out, you get whiskers on your chin. Female castration, can't you get your terminology straight? Whatever they call it, darling, keep what you can. Why should you take estrogen in a dangerous dose every day when you already have an automatic time-release drugstore right in there? She poked at my stomach with a long Q-tip as I shielded myself with a booklet she had just given me titled, Is There Life After His Hysterectomy? Is this interview almost over, I said, looking at my watch? I have a few things to do. Just some forms to sign, and then you go off to see the cute little film script required by law. Will it tell all, more or less? I want the straight truth about sex. Straight, crooked, it's all in the film. What isn't in the film is in the little booklet I gave you. Is sex really the same afterward, I asked. As we all know, sex is in the head. If your head is all right, it will be fine. What about essential organs like the uterus and ovaries? They contribute nothing to ecstasy. Are you sure? The counselor began shredding cotton balls into little bits. Am I God? Do I know everything? I can't live without sex, I said. Look, dear, life is a business of diminishing returns. Whoever guaranteed you full service to the last day? You remind me of my aunt, an old sage, I know. She took my hand. Don't think so much. To think is to worry. Just lie back and enjoy. Lie back where? On the operating table? Certainly, enjoy the bright lights, the clean walls. Never in your life have you been in a place so clean. Not even your grandmother's kitchen. Enjoy the color scheme. Uh, white tiles, green machines. Enjoy the service in the best hotel in the Catskill Mountains you don't get catered to like they do for you in the hospital. You don't have to do a thing for yourself. They carry you everywhere. They pump food into you. They put you to sleep. They pee for you with a tube. With pills and needles, they do everything. It's marvelous. Such a vacation you've never had. It's the one place you don't have to do a thing to live. <laughs>